looks like there's a very purposeful closure of the knobs, the gears, the levers of everything that makes our world tick. We got the food factory fires and the food processing plants all mysteriously burning down at the same time. The smelters have begun to close now. Across the globe in unison, you're seeing all the smelting stop on a dime. So now we got the closure of basic manufacturing on the foodstuffs, on the metals, uh, travel's restricted, and now food shortages coming across the planet. Mark my words, they're going to start shifting gears right now. Since the last time you and I talked, my wife and I started a, a nonprofit that basically goes around and films uh, small farms that are improving our, our local food security and um, and are in some way regenerative or sustainable in nature. And um, so we have a lot of fun doing that. We're working on a bison documentary right now, which is pretty cool. Yeah, and they want to have us believe that those types of animals are the problem, not the 78 corporations that put up 80% of the CO2 on the planet. They want to demonize you for having a cow and me for having ch chickens. It's yeah. unbelievable. There, there were a couple of things, David, that I wanted to talk to you about today because I've actually I've interviewed a lot of people recently, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about your thoughts on regenerative agriculture because I know you've approached this subject several times over the year with um, fertilizer shortages and just the sustainability of right practices. But also, everybody I talk to, when you mention natural climate cycles, it's like I get a blank stare, you know. Um, and that's, I think, playing a big role in some of the things that we're we're facing today. So, yeah, I went up to Joel Salatin's place up there. My wife and myself, we went up to Virginia and spent three days up there. We rented their little tiny house behind the farm, gave us plenty of time to walk around, do some interviews, talk to uh, Daniel up there because Joel wasn't there. But uh, got to cruise around the place, visit a few vineyards, see how people were doing and really get that whole idea of regenerative ag like in your face. OK, send the cattle through first then send the chickens and everything win-wins. Cause you know, we had a lot of insect problems with the ticks and the chiggers and stuff out here and those guinea fowl and the chickens just whoosh, ripped through everything. So at least in the front two and a half acres, oh, I fenced in the front two and a half acres. And that was a project in itself, getting all that four by four uh, woven wire and all the four by four posts up and putting the gates in. But now the chickens running around the periphery, we don't have any more problem with the chiggers and the ticks. We just need to let them get over the fence on the other side now to get back in the Back six acres here. Yeah, you're having better luck than I am. I tried to fence in our birds, and they're everywhere. I mean, they, they just they're fly everywhere. right over. I know. We got a couple of them like that when I sent you that message yesterday. This one, the stupidest guinea of them all, couldn't even come back from the open field on my neighbor's property to, like, fly back over the fence again. I'm like, come on. Yeah. Get the running start, dude, to fly back <laughs> over again. But <laughs> Funny, you know, our ducks, they won't fly anywhere. But if you try and go and catch them, all of a sudden they're airborne, you know, but. Yeah, we learned a real neat trick from one of the old timers here. He was saying that, OK, you're going to get guineas. If you have just a flock of pure guinea, they might just disappear one day because they'll all flock and fly in the same place. But he said, if you mix the guineas with the chickens when they're chicks and just bring them up all together, they won't do that because the chickens aren't going to fly away with the guineas. So they still have that, you know, pack mentality. And that's one way to keep your guineas from all migrating at the same time is blend them with chickens because they, they like to flock together. So the chickens are definitely not going to run. Learning the old timer stuff out here. These old timers are like, dude, you need to brace yourself. This winter is going to be atrociously snowy because the fog in the valley started in uh, like July this year. And usually they say the more days of fog in August in the valley, more snowy. But it started in July this year. See, the old timer guy I talked to like 86 years old. He's like, when I was a young boy, it started a fog in August and we had the deepest snow we ever had. You know, just like bringing back old school tricks, you know. I yeah, well, those guys. it's it's actually interesting because if you look at historical climate cycles and you look at years of La Nina's, Every time we've, we've kind of, I, I, well, I, I read a study uh, about a year ago where they were talking about how the termination cycle of the sun, almost 100% certainty causes a La Nina. And then the chances of a back-to-back -back La Ninas are actually pretty high. But when you come out of those La Nina cycles and you're in the kind of that Enzo neutral period, um, that's when, at least in the Southeast, you can see a lot of 
winter precipitation, which could translate to snowstorms. So he wouldn't be off if if we actually move out of the La Nina cycle. It's, it seems like this one's been an extremely long journey, though. Yeah, I got some new data. I pulled, uh, I was talking, who was I talking to? Uh, but we were talking about El Nino, La Nina. Looking at Argentinian crop production, they were kind of pinning their hopes on the second consecutive La Nina would weaken, but it's not. It's going to continue. It looks until about maybe April or May of next year. So a triple back-to-back -back La Nina, which is interesting talking about the solar cycles because we're supposed to be going into solar max right now. And there's like three sunspots on the sun. And it's been like that for weeks and weeks and weeks. You got like two or three spots. That's super extraordinarily low at going into solar max period that you would have three sunspots, but it matches up with another triple La Nina and Argentinian crop production, just because of that triple La Nina, they're already downgrading, downgrading again, as another 3% off this week. You know, everybody's hoping that Southern hemisphere is going to make up for some of the losses up here. Northern hemisphere doesn't look like it currently. No, so, probably. Yeah. Not. It's going to be a mixed up world here shortly, I believe. Yeah. The um, you mentioned the the solar cycle and and how many sunspots have been lately. A lot of articles came out this year talking about how or yeah within the past year and a half talking about how strong solar cycle twenty five started out. But if you look back at the Dalton minimum, I think that's the one I was looking at where you can kind of trace back and see how those cycles started and ended as they were entering the weaker phase some of those solar cycles started out with a bang and they didn't get very far. And then, you know, it was almost, instead of having a perfect arc up and, and down, like you envision a solar cycle, it was just kind of like you had a spike and then a slow drop off. And the, the, the end of the cycle was, you know, 11 years out. Yeah. I've been getting ready. I know you have too. And I hope, you know, points on the map here of readiness, people will finally connect and restart our society after this event here, because there's a few people around Tennessee who have been really getting ready. I know up your way and a fair few people just a couple hours from here in Nanahala, up in North Carolina, that whole range there, there's an enormous amount of people getting ready. So I think there will be regional pockets that will be uh, the thriving areas during this um, I don't, I don't even know what a word would it be. Like a depression is not really the, the fitting word. I mean, that's just pure economic. This is a civilization reset with the economic reset and a full destruction and reemergence in a new style of uh, like what's like one equals one. And we both understand the value of that. That needs to change completely into something new. So the in all old systems we ever grew up with, Charlie, they're all going away and they're going to be replaced with something. So I, I don't think we have really a term for that yet. Yeah. But regardless of the events, you know, you and I and several others around this pocket here of the southeast, uh, I think we're going to do pretty well to restart the new world. And we'll get through it better than most. I, I think so. Could you, you know, just for viewers who aren't aware of what those events are, could you kind of give me a background on on the events that you're talking about? Well, we know the in the debt cycle, you talked about this many a time, the valuations, et cetera. I mean, look how many companies are collapsing now. The ones that provide us with our goods, like the Targets and the Walmarts. And since the factory closures are happening across China because they have low water, they don't anticipate any factories starting again for another full four weeks from now. So if you, if you knock out global manufacturing for a two-month period down to zero, even if you had your orders in, eh, they're not going to be forthcoming. And everything we see, at least my, I, you know, Maybe you're seeing something different out there, but it looks like there's a very purposeful closure of the knobs, the gears, the levers of everything that makes our world tick and that just in time delivery system on purpose. we got the food factory fires and the food processing plants all mysteriously burning down at the same time or exploding and these types of things taking all production offline. And, you know, I have a contact down in Cyprus that's in the metals industry on the wholesale copper side from the mines to the LME was saying the smelters have begun to close now. So in the last month, you know, you got New Zealand, um, all across the EU, the smelters are gonna stop. They don't have enough power, same with Russia, or not with Russia, excuse me, with China. They don't have enough power to run like those really heavy industries. So across the globe in unison, you're seeing all the smelting stop on a dime. So to go from ingots into rod, that's not gonna happen any longer. So Malaysia is affected as well. They're closing out plants down there. So. At, it's, it's turning over to the next um, phase, if you will, because imagine if you shut down all the smelters across the planet, like what kind of disruption that would be for base metals, 
into the manufacturing, then our communications goes. We don't have any more of that. And uh, everywhere you look on just basic infrastructure or manufacturing would stop. So now we got the closure of basic manufacturing on the foodstuffs, on the metals, uh, travels restricted, and now food shortages coming across the planet. And I'll say one last thing here. USDA and European forecasting agencies and CONAB in Brazil, they've been coming out with all these rosy forecasts on production. But mark my words, they're going to start shifting gears right now and downgrading an enormous amount of what was going to be rosy yields because they have to. We're coming into the harvest season in just a couple more weeks. So they're not going to be put out in history as making a bad call where you can point to them by name and saying you were so far off by 25 percent. How do you still have your job? They're going to they're going to turn the ship and all start in unison coming over with downgrade, downgrade, downgrade. So they're on the record as calling for the downgrades instead of us calling them out as having such fictitious, bogus calls that moved markets. So everybody's going to come back on the record. So there's going to be a huge shift. And then the economy needs to crash to absolute zero before they can institute and restart a new set of economic structure like I say, a, a basic asset value class where everybody agrees on the asset of one equals one that can be traded globally. So I accept your one unit is equaling one and I can trade for that onward in a different market or a different continent because it still equals one and everybody understands that. But everything needs to evaporate to zero and start with a new one until we all agree on set values again. These are the problems that I see, like these, these five pillars of problems that are coming in right now. All at the same time, all amplifying right now, and especially through the crop harvest season and then into 2023 with even deeper fertilizer shortages. Now, with that said, I know you've been studying a lot of the same stuff, so I'd like to hear your take on it, too. Well, I think, you know, when you, you mentioned the USDA downgrading, they've actually started downgrading several crops. We saw the cotton crop get downgraded to the worst that it's been since, I don't know, the 1800s, was it? Or I mean, it was right. pretty pretty bad crop um you've you've seen them downgrade the corn crop although the the wording hasn't really triggered much of a reaction but they have actually downgraded corn crop i mean we're only at um 60 percent uh, good condition right now i mean that's pretty weak compared to other years probably a lot of that has to do with fertilizer shortages not having the inputs that we would normally have for it um and i think you know you a lot of people don't pay attention to uh, non-commodity crop reports, but when you look at the amount of agricultural infrastructure that's been lost out west uh, due to the drought conditions, you're talking entire orchards being taken down. That you know, it takes several years to get a fruit or a nut tree to start producing um, asparagus asparagus crops those take at least you know a year before they start producing so when i talk agricultural infrastructure i'm talking about these longer term crops that take years to grow just being completely wiped out from the droughts they've had to take them out of the ground and then when you look at you know the cattle on the market head of cattle i, I talked about this the other day in a video but um you've had a lot of farmers having to take not just you know the the feeder cattle that they would normally take to slaughter but they're also taking a lot of their seed stock, the cows they use to breed, the breeding stock to to grow their herds to uh, to slaughter. And the, the reason why they're doing that is because, you know, with the drought conditions, we're having, you know, there's not enough water. There's not enough uh, grass to, to feed their animals. And so when you add all of that up, you know, it's it's really the, these are triggers that um, have been pulled already. They just haven't hit the market yet. You know, uh, and if, if anything, when you take a bunch of cows to slaughter to be processed, uh, you're actually driving down the rates uh, that the consumers are paying. And it, it, people haven't recognized that because in reality, the prices are still rising. You know, we've seen that uh, last year. It happened again, you know, as well. The prices came down, but they didn't come into the super spike pricing, which a lot were expecting. So what do you think that delay time might be for a super spike in the uh, in the mead? I think, you know, it'll be sometime next year when we start really seeing where the supply shortages are coming into to the supply chain. I mean, we have seen, um, you know, we saw that during COVID when we had processors shutting down. This is going to be a different type of shortage. This is going to be, a, you know, an availability of of cows to slaughter when you 
when you have such a large quantity having to be culled uh, because of the the conditions this year. And I think, you know, it, it's not an easy fix because you've it's going to take a calf at least two years to get up to breeding age. So if you want to replace that breeding stock to get the herd sizes back up to where they were, uh, it's going to take at least a couple of years of good conditions. As we know, with agriculture, you could put timestamps on things, but you need those conditions to be right to be able to meet those conditions. But so I think, you know, next year we're going to start seeing uh, spikes in meat production. I think we're also going to see a large spike in feed costs. We we thought we saw one at the beginning of this year, but I don't think it matches up to what we're going to see after this year's crop numbers come in and they're, and they're finalized. Let me ask you about uh, food sustainability. So let's say just an imaginary exercise here. Everything west of the Mississippi was cut off and there was no way to really transport from the west out to here. Do you think everything east of the Mississippi could be self-sustaining and cattle industry could continue to run on what those northern corn states are providing in addition to what you know you could put out for natural uh, pasture? Do you think there would be enough or is it all there's more reliance on what's west of the Mississippi to keep this entire industry going? You know, there's cattle production here in the east and I see Angus everywhere around here in East Tennessee, but without those inputs from other places. So could it be a self-autonomous zone, the east of Mississippi and then west of Mississippi be its own? Probably not because you, I mean, when you look at how they've stocked animals per acre, for example, out east, um, a lot of that isn't doable if you're doing grass fed, grass finished. You know, you can run mm -hmm. a certain number head of animals on your grass plants, but then when you get into the winter time, if you haven't been able to put up hay because you're, you're basically overstocked what the natural capacity could be, then you're relying on those grains from, from out west. So, and it, the other thing is when you consider how many people there are on the East Coast with the big cities going all the way up the East Coast, there's probably not enough being produced on the eastern side of the country to take care of the eastern side of the country. I mean, we we forget that those flyover states, those massive states of agriculture are producing an, a, a ton of food that's and population wise, the East Coast is still heavily populated. And, and uh, definitely reliant on it. Yeah, big changes are inbound for sure. And I, I can only map out what I can see in terms of my perspective of looking at others reporting and, you know, people sending me like you as well, people sending me links to things to take a look at and try to make some sense of it. Like, what do you see your time forecast in, in terms of us being pinched and hit economically? How, how are you seeing it moving out? from from now through the end of the year or even into next year? Well, I think as we get into the end of the year and we start seeing the actual uh, production numbers, you're going to start seeing an increase in, in the food commodity prices. I mean, that's just the reality of it. I mean, that that's the market moving it, and that's why we call them commodities. They're, they're traded. So as traders really start getting the grasp of reality, those numbers will start going up. You and I had a conversation uh, a couple of years ago. If you look at food prices a couple of years ago compared to where they are now, um, it's <laughs> drastically different. But you had asked me, you know, what my thought was as far as when people would start to realize, and this was before COVID, the prices of things going up and, uh, you know, the supply shortages kind of ensuing. And one of the things we talked about is that as people, we tend to, adapt ment mentally to what's going on. So we we see the prices go up, um, we get used to it and we accept it and just keep going with it. And that's how, you know, you hear numbers from the Fed on, on what, you know, the current inflation rate is and people hear a number of 3%, 5%, 8% doesn't sound that bad, but it's when it's compiled, that's when it's adding up. But we don't recognize it because it takes time. But if you actually were to look back at what you used to spend on your groceries a couple of years ago, um, there's a dramatic difference. And I think it actually already has started impacting consumers. I think that people are, you know, that you we pumped a ton of money into the economy. So you, you saw a lot of people get a pay raise from doing what they were doing before. But even with those increased earnings, 
you know, people are having a hard time with their cost of living. You've got uh, an, an average of $2,000 a month or a median of $2,000 a month rent for the average renter in the United States. That's a significant number. Um, when you, but that's what happens when you come out with these plans where the government is subsidizing rent during a pandemic and they're saying, okay, well, we're going to pay up to 150% of the average rent in this area if you qualify. Well, every landlord on earth is going to look at that and say, well, then I could raise the rent on my tenants, you know, because the government's going to step in and pay for it. And all of that's starting to go away now. There's some of those programs are, uh, their their funds are expensed. They're, you're going to start seeing a lot of people who have been dependent on those programs not have a place to go. And, you know, the landlords are now used to getting a much higher rent. The same thing happens with food. The retail numbers are, are up. But if you were paying attention last year, uh, credit became very easy for a lot of people. It was like, I don't know what they do with the scores, but it bumped everybody's scores up. If you talk to a lot of different people, they opened up new credit accounts. They started getting new credit cards. And so it's almost like we've created a, a consumer credit crunch right around the corner. Now you're starting to see, you know, scores drop back down. The availability of credit has gone away um, and, and we're raising interest rates. So you've got a ton of people who went into debt over the past couple of years when credit became extremely easy. And then they turn around and every single month that bill is going up because we're, we're raising interest rates to, to stop inflation. So I think that the, these are all real issues and I think they're all starting to compile. What amazes me is that when I see people out there struggling with these things, um, the, the average person is still kind of accepting it as the norm, you know, three months after they've you know been impacted by the change. Yeah, because I'm just going to take a chapter from any history book in a collapsed society through, I'm going to go back 6,000 years, choose the one you like. Whenever that basic standard of living cannot be met by the working wages, there's problems. And I think we're ever so close to that right now. Because imagine the average person who can't control money getting a $10,000 or a $15,000 credit limit on their card at 18% and they've maxed it out and now they're spending 1800 bucks a year on interest, even their basic payments aren't bringing that down. And if they're running razor thin anyway, because you're paying 50% more for your electricity, food prices have doubled, gasoline prices, wherever you are in America, out of control, uh, insurance rates going up, everything that you can possibly look at as an increase in just daily living has gone up to the point where those that are not really in the a, a buffer zone of extra money at the end of each month, they're gonna struggle. They're gonna get completely wiped out. And at what point does the bank stop allowing them to use their credit card? And then what's left at that point? They have no more lifeline. <laughs>